introduction, Martin. Perfect. So whenever you are ready, uh, please go ahead and uh, you can begin your presentation. Thanks for being with us. Absolutely. Again, I'd like to thank Sentica for the platform to talk to all of you today. Today, I'll be highlighting certain select applications of our liposomal gadolinium nanoparticle platform, particularly for placental applications. So I am a member of, of the Translational Imaging Group, or TIGER, at Texas Children's Hospital and Baylor College of Medicine. In addition to using different novel contrast mechanisms, we're also deeply interested in translating preclinical imaging research into actual clinical practice to improve patient outcomes. Now, today I'm focusing mostly on our novel nanoparticle platform, and I'm gonna be talking today about some research applications that we have for using this application. Now, I know we also use this for a variety of other different preclinical research applications, such as cancer imaging and Alzheimer's imaging. But the two primary ones that I want to talk to you about today are research applications in the placenta, which is a relatively poorly studied and poorly researched organ, but also extremely critical for gestational development. Now, what is this nanoparticle agent that I will be using, in, which is the uh, feature of this talk? This is a liposomal gadolinium nanoparticle contrast agent. You can see the uh, molecular diagram on the screen here uh, with gadolinium. In this case, uh, doterm specifically is uh, chelated within a lipid bilayer on the outer ring for, uh, this, uh, for this contrast agent. The reason that we've conjugated the uh, gadolinium within this lipid bilayer is that it enables a long half-life and stable uniform vascular enhancement. The half-life in blood for this agent is approximately 18 hours, which gives ample time for uh, imaging the uh, vasculature target or any other feature of interest and is extremely important. Additionally, its size is also of importance. It's uh, quite small, as you can see on the far right. It's 50 times smaller than a red blood cell, and it allows for a clearance mechanism through the reticuloendothelial system, the liver and spleen which further uh, helps prevent some of the issues that we have with accumulation with gadolinium and also helps us deal with some of the biggest issues with gadolinium use, which is beginning to see issues in clinical practice. Specifically, we have engineered this nanoparticle agent to not permeate the placental barrier in pregnant rat and mice models. This is a critical development for being able to utilize gadolinium in fetal imaging and also being able to use this for being able to look at placental disorders. For more information about the clearance mechanisms and the claims that we have in this, uh, uh, in this uh, talk, I strongly advise you to look at research from our lab. I actually have two papers at the bottom here and I think one of the authors is actually in the chat here today. Uh, if you wish to talk to him about that. Now, why are we using this gadolinium agent at one Tesla? Specifically, why are we using a permanent magnet? Uh, shown here on the left are certain phantoms that we use with varying concentrations of gadolinium in addition uh, to uh, two of our liposomal preps with the agent in solution. We also have just base doterem. And as you can see, as uh, concentration increases, we have signal increase, which you would expect for contrast enhanced magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, for MRI, a higher signal uh, will be expected with a higher concentration of gadolinium. And you can see as well on the right with this chart, uh, MRI signal in a T1-weighted 3D GRE image, you see that uh, our uh, DSP liposome the formulation that you'll be seeing throughout this talk has the highest signal intensity uh, of the three preparations that we're showing on the slide. Additionally, when we think about the relaxivity and the performance of this agent at one Tesla, we can see that the relaxivity, which is the enhancement for uh, as a result of T1 changes in the MR environment is much higher at a field strength of one Tesla as opposed to higher field strengths at 4.7 and 7. This is a conscious choice and we do this because clinical applications often are at lower field strengths, 1.5 Tesla and 3 Tesla. So being able to use a clinical agent or a contrast agent that could actually be translated to clinic means that we need to be conscious about using lower field strength applications. Now, in addition to having this uh, MRI platform, we've also conjugated another liposomal iodine nanoparticle contrast agent that we use for contrast enhanced computed tomography, which I'll be talking about and showing data for later in this presentation. Uh, this agent also has a very long half-life of 40 hours and has similar clearance mechanisms and also is relatively small, which aids in its clearance through the reticuloendothelial system. Now, as a quick overview and a roadmap for the talk I'll be giving today, there are two primary placental applications that I like to focus on. 
The first is T1 mapping of placental vasculature using this novel nanoparticle agent, which you can see here on the left. And the second topic will be preclinical imaging of the retroplacental clear space throughout gestation. The retroplacental clear space is a junctional zone between the placenta and the myometrial wall, which is extremely important for being able to diagnose placental accreta or invasive placentation. Being able to visualize that is extremely valuable, and I'd like to share some of the research that I have looking at different disorders with, these target, with this target organ. So now I'm just going to pause really quickly and start talking about that first study, which is using this nanoparticle platform to do T1 mapping in vivo in order to assess placental vasculature. So why am I doing this? And this is an extremely important question because a question many of you might be thinking about right now is why do we even need to use contrast enhanced imaging? You have ultrasound techniques and you have, and you have normal conventional MR techniques for being able to assess the health of the placenta. So why are we interested in contrast enhanced uh, techniques? And the reason is because while there has been a large amount of development and many great techniques in the field of ultrasound, ultrasound still struggles with certain uh, different metrics for assessing pregnancy, specifically looking at the placenta fractional moving blood volume or FMVV. FMVV is essentially a surrogate measure for the amount of perfusion within a target organ, which could be extremely important for looking at local ischemia or looking at different issues with vasculature pathology in the placenta. However, Doppler ultrasound, despite these advances, has a high variance in estimates and is very difficult to get very clear uh, results for, which means that we are motivated to uh, find a definitive measure of placental perfusion, a direct measure of the amount of tissue of blood in the uh, tissue in the target region of interest, which is the placenta. We can do this using contrast enhanced MRI as a technique. In this part of the talk, I will be showing how we can estimate fractional blood volume, FBV, which is a direct measurement of tissue uh, of uh, tissue blood volume in a pregnant, pregnant mouse model using contrast enhanced MRI. And we'll do this by performing T1 mapping both pre and post administration of this liposomal gadolinium agent to get T1 values pre and post contrast and find and calculate this fractional blood volume. So as I mentioned, this is a murine research model and we are looking at mice, we're looking at a pregnant mouse model and we're using uh, one Tesla permanent magnets that are developed by Aspect. The one Tesla permanent magnet is a pretty useful system for us. You, I have the uh, system shown here on uh, the image here on screen and you're, you can see the setup that we have for circulating water bath to keep the animal warm, um, a uh, isoflurane absorber to prevent exposure to the uh, user, in addition to respiratory and, ca and cardiac gating, which is that box in the far end of the table. Additionally, the magnet itself is in the far left-hand side here, and you can see just the convenience of being able to have a permanent magnet with electronics just nearby. It's a very nice system. So now the actual uh, technical specifications, let's, let's talk, talk shop. We're looking at a 3D T2-weighted fast spin echo sequence for our anatomical imaging. Our spatial resolution is shown at the bottom. Uh, we are not using isotropic resolution for this anatomical scan. This is just to get relatively high resolution uh, images of the uh, placenta and the target features with a relatively thick slice of 0.8 millimeters. This is a 12-minute scan. And, uh, and additionally, the main workhorse for this study is a gradient recall echo sequence, T1 weighted. This is an isotropic sequence with uh, lower resolution, the 0.5 uh, millimeter cubed uh, isotropic resolution. And this is a 15 minute scan as we dial through five different flip angles, which I'll talk about in just a minute, how exactly we calculate T1 values using a variable flip angle method. Uh, additionally, I just want to talk a little bit more about our experimental setup here. So uh, in this room, we actually are a little bit cramped, but uh, we make it work. We have two of these uh, one Tesla permanent magnet scanners and uh, we use them pretty frequently. We uh, have a pretty high throughput. We image anywhere from 10 to 30 animals a day, often for a variety of different research applications. And uh, we uh, are very happy with the performance of these machines and being able to do so much work in such a limited space. Now, what does it look like when we actually administer liposomal gadolinium in vivo? Here, I'm looking at day 14 of gestation. Uh, for people that are unfamiliar, the murine model for pregnancy is typically about 21 days to gestation, uh, to, uh, to term, 
uh, in mice. On the left, I have a non-contrast T2-weighted fast spin echo image where you can see the fetal compartment, which is a little bit brighter than the darker band here for the placenta, this kind of crescent shape, which we'll expect to see for uh, uh, mammals such as mice and also in humans as well, this crescent placental shape. Um, we then look at a T1-weighted grading recall echo sequence here in the middle, which is pre-administration of the liposomal contrast. And you can see that the entire fetal compartment and the placenta is very dark. It is very difficult to delineate between the placenta and the FPU. However, once the uh, liposomal administer is administered, you can see the signal enhancement in blood vessels within the placenta. You can see it light up with very high signal relative to the FPU, which gives us very high contrast to noise ratio, and it's very useful for being able to actually identify the placenta and look at those vessels that are enhancing as a result of this blood pool imaging. Now, how do we actually perform T1 mapping with this gradient recall echo protocol? So like I mentioned, we're acquiring five different flip angles, eight, 15, 25, 35, and 45. And you can see in these images kind of the impact on signal quality and uh, signal intensity as the flip angle changes. And we then simply take the uh, GRE signal equation, as you can see up here at the top left, and we reconfigure it so that we can get a fit for a parent signal in the image, so the apparent signal that you're actually seeing in these images, and we relate that to a set of different parameters that are known, such as repetition time and uh, proton density, which is a constant for the instrument. And the we then back solve for the T1 relaxation time with knowledge of the flip angle, and uh, we use this to get a fit for the T1 values. By doing this, we're able to actually calculate T1 values both pre and post contrast for any anatomical region of interest in the field of view. In this case, we're most interested in the placenta, which is, as I mentioned, that crescent band along the fetal placental unit. So what does this look like at different time points? So we uh, looked at three different time points in the latter half of gestation, day 14, 16, and 18. Remember day 21 is typically the end of uh, gestation. And you can see in the top row, I have pre-contrast images and post-contrast images. I've made volume renderings of the T1 values that we've calculated for the uterine tract here. You can see uh, the different FPUs and uh, see a relatively low amount of uh, a relatively homogeneous signal between uh, uh, the different uh, fetal placental units. Also notice there's a little bit of a band here on the edges here, which is somewhat artifactual just as a result of the, of the volume rendering. But once we administer contrast, you can see in these volume renderings how the placenta lights up. And we now have this light blue area here, which is actually the placenta for these different FPUs. And you can see that that is a result of the T1 time reducing because of the uh, signal enhancement as a result of liposomal contrast. So from this, how do we contrast fractional blood volume? Well, we do so by setting a reference point with a fully vascularized compartment, which in this case is the inferior vena cava or the IVC, which is denoted here by the, by the yellow arrow. This is some a vessel that we're assuming to be fully perfused or 100% blood volume. So we relate the change in relaxation, the change in T1 relaxation time in the IVZ to the target uh, organ of interest, which is the placenta, and the ratio of change gives us the fractional blood volume. In order to uh, uh, then take a look at the different vasculature patterns that we have, I'm here I'm showing a coronal MIP image, which is a projection of the uh, of different slices in the coronal plane for these MR images. And you can see and appreciate just how uh, much signal enhancement we have within the uh, vasculature image, uh, with vasculature imaging at one Tesla using these uh, uh, permanent magnets. You can see we have pretty high signal quality. And also you can see this, the uniform signal enhancement that we have in vascular compartments like the IVC and different draining vessels and other larger blood vessels around anatomy of interest. Note as well how the signal enhancement is so much higher in the IVC versus other target organs like the placenta. Now, how do we validate these measures for fractional blood volume? Because I've kind of talked about a relatively indirect way of being able to estimate fractional blood volume using MRI, where we have to calculate T1 before we can get a direct estimate of fractional blood volume. In this case, our method is to actually look at signal enhancement in contrast enhanced CT. So we take the same animals that we used in uh, our MRI pool, and we then tested them in computed tomography. And uh, we used our liposomal iodine agent for that. And 
And the reason we did that is because in CT, as opposed to MRI, signal enhancement is directly proportional to the concentration of iodine. So simply taking the ratio of signal enhancement in the IVC to the placenta allows us to get a fractional blood volume estimate. Also, CT is really valuable as well because we're able to have higher resolution imaging where we can use to also validate some of the findings we have in MRI. And you can see on the right here with this 70 micron isotropic uh, acquisition using a Siemens Envion CT scanner, uh, we uh, have very high resolution images of uh, the uh, uh, mouse torso and the uh, placenta. And you can see the different vasculature in this rotating image at day 18. So when comparing the uh, results that we had, interestingly, we did not find a very large increase in fractional blood volume at the three different time points. At day 14, 16, and 18, we found those mean values hovering around uh, about like 45 to 50%. Um, we found that day 18 that those estimates were slightly larger, but we did not find significance due to variation between the different groups. Additionally, we performed bland Altman analysis, which are those scatter plots that you see at the bottom here, looking at percent difference between paired estimates of fractional blood volume between the different FPUs. We had approximately 24 FPUs at each of the three different time points, and we found that only two FPUs, one at day 14 and one at day 18, were outside the confidence interval uh, for analysis which indicates that both MRI and CT can be used interchangeably, thus helping validate the method, uh, the contrast enhanced method for being able to estimate fractional blood volume. So with that, I'd like to just conclude uh, and just wrap up briefly this first study. Uh, using contrast-enhanced MRI with this liposomal gadolinium nanoparticle agent in a rodent model, we were able to consistently map T1 values of placental tissue, both pre and post contrast, and enable estimation of placental FPV. Now, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done for this project. We do have a manuscript and review mostly talking about this method because we do feel as though we've done enough to validate this method for estimating fractional blood volume. But we still want to learn more about, about these placental marker, uh, placental perfusion markers and how they can be used. A particular interest is potentially using this for longitudinal comparison with 3D power Doppler in order to improve those estimates and kind of tighten those error bars that you have with uh, Doppler ultrasound and also looking at these at additional time points. Finally, in order to further validate this method, I would also consider uh, looking at uh, histopathology and looking at vascular density uh, with different staining techniques in order to look at uh, vessel density. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and just uh, pause for a moment. Uh, I believe Martin has an audience poll that he'd like to administer for all of you uh, to learn a little bit more about research applications in your labs. Thank you all very much. and I'll take a quick break. All right. Thank you very much, Andrew, for um, that excellent first uh, part of your presentation, and we'll give you an opportunity just to catch your breath. Um, and yes, as Andrew mentioned, we would like to uh, run a quick poll, and this is actually a two-part poll. So there's two questions here. If you could just submit the re replies that best apply to you. The first question what type of imaging are you currently using in your studies is a multiple choice question. Select all that apply. The options are ultrasound, MRI, CT, PET SPECT, uh, optical imaging, perhaps uh, bioluminescence, something like that. If there is another technology that's not listed, please specify in the chat window. And there is an option for none as well. Question two is uh, specifically related to MRI. Do you currently have access to an MRI for your studies? And there are four options. Um, you might have one and you're satisfied with the costs associated with conducting those studies. You might have access to MRI, but it is quite expensive or perhaps difficult to book. Uh, the third option is no, but you would like to use MRI in your work. And finally, uh, no, you have no need for MRI in your studies. So. Um, I'll just leave this poll open for a few more moments. Most of you have already voted. I'll take this opportunity also just to remind you that we will be running a Q&A, a question and answer session. Following the talk, we should have probably 10 to 15 minutes or so for that. So I would encourage you to please submit your questions through our Q&A uh, dialog box, and we'll get to as many as possible at the end of the, the talk. 
Okay, so with that in mind, Andrew, I'm going to bring you back on audio and uh, please proceed whenever you're ready with the second part of your presentation. Great. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for the reintroduction. So uh, we're about to move on to the second part of the talk. And like Martin mentioned, uh, feel free to add, ask questions in the Q&A section. I already see that there are a couple of good ones that I'll talk about at the end of this talk. So now uh, I'd like to move on to the second part of my talk, which is preclinical MR imaging of the retroplacental clear space throughout gestation. This is a very exciting topic for me as we have uh, quite a bit of published literature on this topic, which I highly recommend people take a look at after the end of this talk and uh, kind of talks a little bit more about the technical specifications and some of the techniques and work that we've done in this space. So why are we interested in the retroplacental clear space? The primary pathology motivating the study is a better understanding of morbidly adherent placenta, or MAP, which occurs when the placenta grows too deeply into the uterine wall and complicates delivery. There's been a near fourfold increase in prevalence of MAP since 1980. However, only half of MAP cases are diagnosed prior to childbirth. Magnetic resonance imaging is often used as the gold standard when ultrasound findings are unclear or when there are enough risk factors for diagnosis for MAP. However, this is still undesirable, however, as um, in MRI of MAP, it essentially relies on indirect signs, dark bands in the placenta, increased vascularity, or particularly the positioning of the fetus in utero. This is mostly stems from the fact that the retroplacental clear space, which is a junctional zone between the placenta and the myometrial wall, this interface zone, is not clearly visible in conventional MRI and nowhere near visible in conventional ultrasound. We need a reliable, non-invasive method for being able to visualize this clear space so we can determine if invasion is happening as the placenta crosses this zone into the wall. So the study goal for this, and again, this has been done multiple studies uh, from our lab, is to characterize the retroplacental clear space in a pregnant mouse model using contrast enhanced MRI. So in this key image that I have here on the right, I have a T2-weighted anatomical Fassman echo image along with uh, segmentations of the uh, placenta and FPU at this time point. This is about day, I think, uh, 12 or 14 in gestation, along with, at the bottom right here, a single FPU with visualization of a dark band here, the retroplacental clear space between the placenta and the brighter vascularized band of the, uh, of the myometrial wall. So uh, this is just an overview for the imaging study that we did uh, for this uh, study. Again, this is actually published data. Uh, we looked at the second half of gestation starting at day 10 of about 21. Uh, and we looked at five different time points, 10, 12, 14, 16, and 18 days. And we tested three C57 black six mice at each of these three different time points and cited about eight to 10 FPUs per animal. FPU stands for fetal placental unit, by the way. Uh, you can see the number of FPUs that we accumulated at each time point here on the right. Since each mouse bears multiple FPUs, we felt as though to minimize the number of dam sacrifice that three was an appropriate amount to get appropriate statistics for the study. Again, we are using the uh, uh, one Tesla permanent magnet. This is an aspect M2, by the way, uh, the system that we have visualized here, uh, sorry, image uh, in the image here. We also use an aspect M7 as well, which we often use for actually higher resolution imaging, which I'll talk about later. Um, the M2 here has, a, again, use, it's using a 3D T2-weighted FSD sequence. This is our standard anatomical sequence. And then we are also using a high-res 3D T1-weighted gradient recall echo sequence with 300 micron isotropic resolution. Now I'd like to talk really quickly about the uh, acquisition time for this study and motion gating. So a big problem with fetal imaging is we can't just gate for respiratory and cardiac motion for the mother. We also have to be concerned about fetal motion as well, which can't really be gated for externally. Our only real recourse is to acquire multiple acquisitions and throw out averages that have a lot of motion artifact that is a result from fetal motion. So our uh, scan time actually here uh, encompasses uh, five averages, five external averages that we have for this gradient recall echo protocol. Uh, so 
a, valu a very valuable uh, part about using our liposomal agent is that it facilitates automated segmentation of the placenta. So here I'm using ITK SNAP, which is um, a program that is freely available and that you can use to look at your imaging data. And uh, I've loaded in the DICOMs for both a T2 weighted FASTMAN echo and a post contrast T1 weighted gradient recall echo sequence, as you can see here. And I've just added three seeds to uh, uh, three different placenta for three FPUs, as you can see here. And at the uh, T2-weighted FSC, this grow region has a lot of issues actually just getting the placenta. It's actually bleeding into the FPUs, you can see on the left here. Whereas in the contrast enhanced imaging, it will automatically just uh, cover just the placenta itself with uh, minor issues. Like for instance here, it's actually growing into uh, the endometrial wall, which is undesirable. But for the most part, it does work relatively well. Uh, this automated segmentation is very useful as we can actually get uh, segmentations for the FPU, for volumes for the, for the fetal compartment and for the placenta as you can see here at all five different gestational ages. And you can just take a moment to appreciate how much uh, growth there is, particularly in the fetal compartment as uh, gestation progresses from day 10 to day 18 uh, in these images. Additionally, when actually looking at the retrieval central clear space, uh, we found that the RPCS begins to actually uh, show at uh, day 12 of gestation. At day 10 before then, the placenta is kind of this ball-like structure around the uh, fetal compartment, and it's very different to, difficult to see. Note here in uh, my key here that AF stands for amniotic fluid, which is just uh, what we're using to denote the fetal compartment. And again, note in the pre-contrast images that the amniotic fluid and placenta is virtually indistinguishable. It's very different to be able to see uh, either of those, whereas after contrast is administered, the placenta denoted by this pink P is much easier to see. The red asterisk shows the band that we have for looking at this junctional zone, and you can see it clearer at uh, day 16 compared to some of the other time points. Uh, so uh, using our segmentation method uh, in ITK SNAP, we were able to get volumes for the placenta, amniotic fluid, and retroplacental clear space. Uh, no real surprises for the amniotic fluid. It uh, shows just a huge amount of growth near day 16 and 18, uh, near the end of term. Uh, whereas in the placenta, interestingly, it showed uh, increased progression, increased volume development uh, through the first four, day, uh, four time points, whereas at day 18, it was not significantly different from 16, which might indicate that uh, there's a kind of less development or it's fully developed at that point. The more, uh, more research would have to be done to actually determine if that's true or not. Most interestingly, however, is here on the far right, looking at the segments at RPCS volume, we can see that days 12 and 14, that volume really hasn't changed very much. And at day 16, it shoots up. It's significantly different at day 14, and then at day 18 drops back down. This is an interesting finding that we're still trying to wrap our heads around. Uh, we have some theories. We think that possibly as this amniotic fluid compartment is growing, that there is potential compression, but it's difficult to say, uh, especially given just the number of spiral arteries traversing that region and just questions about the compressibility of that space. But that's still ongoing work in our lab to try and answer that question, which we find very interesting. Uh, in order to validate our contrast enhanced MRI findings, we also performed histopathology, H&E staining. So we looked at uh, all the five different time points and looked at different FPUs, but uh, here I'm just looking at uh, three time points, days 10, 14, and 18. And here you can see on the left, uh, just an image for uh, one of these FPUs. You can see it's still very difficult to actually really see what is exactly the placenta and how it's developing. It's kind of this ball-like uh, uh, structure. You don't have that uh, that signature crescent shape, which you begin to see at days 14 and days eight, and day 18. Uh, the fetus in these uh, images, by the way, is at the bottom, especially at day 18. It had to be cropped in order for me to keep all these images at the same resolution um, and scale. Uh, here, uh, when looking at the uh, key for these, P is for placenta, M is for myometrial wall, and star is for the junctional zone, the RPCS. Interestingly, you'll note that the uh, uh, zone is less uh, less populated, cellular, is uh, more acellular than uh, the uh, placenta and uh, myometrial wall, particularly at day 18. So with that, I'd like to just conclude this second study. Like I mentioned, all of this work can be found in the uh, February 2019 uh, edition for uh, Placenta. We were actually featured on the uh, cover for, uh, uh, for, that, for that publication. 
Uh, we found in this study that contrast enhanced MRI with a liposomal gadolinium agent enables in rodent models consistent visualization of the RPCS starting at day 12, enables a long window for image acquisition using this blood pool agent, and enables a quantitative assessment of fetal placental features, particularly anatomical features. And this is one of the one of the uh, one of the few studies that I've seen in the literature that really looks at gestational development in that second half of gestation using imaging, which I think is really valuable for other researchers to look at. Now at this point, I've spent a lot of time talking about placental applications, and I know a lot of people in this chat probably are interested in other types of applications in addition to placental imaging. So I'd like to really quickly talk about uh, some of the work we do looking at tumor progression and vasculature. Uh, characterization. So here is an example for a spontaneous model of uh, neuroblastoma in the kidneys developing in the adrenals. This is a TH Micken model, which is a very well studied model in the literature, a spontaneous transgenic animal that will develop uh, both uh, lesions uh, near the uh, near the kidney and in the adrenal, but also show paraspinal growth, as you can see here along the spine and up here. This is a secondary mass that you have very close to the lungs at six weeks. This is a uh, really interesting data for us, and it's really important to note that uh, it's very valuable to use these uh, these permanent magnets as we have relatively high throughput for single animal imaging, and we're able to uh, look at you know dozens of animals per day and be able to just uh, characterize this uh, longitudinal progression throughout the uh, tumor development, which is very critical for being able to not just get volume estimates, but also look at vasculature progression and maybe other secondary findings, which you may not be able to get using calipers or other measurements for external measurements. We also looked at a transgenic bilateral model for neuroblastoma, a much slower developing tumor model. Uh, this one starts at about 12 weeks and over the course of four weeks you'll see just massive progression in both adrenals for the kidneys as you can see here. This is also a very valuable model for us as we can able, we're able to actually uh, look at vasculature progression in the images uh, using both uh, magnetic resonance angiography with our, our liposomal gadolinium agents. Here we're actually just using it as a true blood pool agent where we're watching it accumulate in blood vessels both the uh, larger vessels like the IVC where we can see infiltration of these lesions into the IVC. You can kind of see it's cut away here and we can also visualize development of draining vessels within uh, on the periphery of the uh, of the tumor volume. This is also uh, very useful for contrast enhanced computed tomography imaging where we can get much higher resolution and we can really dial into and visualize the different uh, vasculature patterns in the tumor, particularly what is the vasculature development at the peripherals of the uh, periphery of the tumor, as you can see large amounts of uh, different small blood vessels and larger draining vessels on the periphery of the tumor versus the lessly avascularized core, which could be necrotic or could be having other issues with vascularization. This is very interesting data. It's very important to look at for being able to monitor, uh, monitor tumor progression and it uh, could be used for future therapies, especially looking at the tumor microenvironment. Uh, note that this is a 70 micron resolution scan and this is a 10 minute scan protocol. And uh, we had a question about the uh, program that we're using uh, for this. This is Osirix. Um, this is a, a, a software that's used uh, for Mac that you can uh, download with a license. Uh, there's a free version of of it called Horos, actually, which is uh, really valuable and I use pretty frequently. It's, it has some features that um, Osirix doesn't have, but it's still very valuable for being able to get these uh, fly through images that you can see and you've seen throughout this presentation. So with that, uh, I'd like to conclude my presentation so that way we have plenty of time to talk about, uh, to go through questions. Uh, in conclusion, we've demonstrated these liposomal based nanoparticle contrast agents have a wide variety of preclinical applications. We looked at blood pool imaging for characterizing placental disorders, looking at placental vasculature, looking at the retroplacental clear space. And we also talked briefly about looking at tumor angiogenesis and characterizing the tumor microenvironment, uh, both using MR techniques and this contrast enhancement. Uh, protocol, both in MRI and CT. Uh, note that every vasculature and MR image that I've shown today is using either the M2 or the M7 at one Tesla. And I can talk more about performance on other machines. We have access to a Bruker 9.7 uh, Tesla, for instance, that we also will use for confirmation and uh, other visualization for these uh, 
for these projects. Uh, but with that, I would like to just acknowledge my group. I work with a phenomenal group of researchers and scientists in the Translational Imaging Group here at TCH. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge our funding for the placental imaging that we've done. And with that, I'd like to conclude and thank all of you for your attention and open the floor for questions. All right, thank you so much, Andrew, for that really, really informative uh, presentation. Um, it was really, really uh, interesting, and uh, we have had some questions come through. I would encourage everyone to continue to post those questions, and like I said earlier, we'll get to as many as possible. Okay, so um, there are some questions coming through. We also uh, prepared a couple of questions based on some of the input we got during the registration process. So, Andrew, the first question is, most preclinical MRI is performed at higher field strengths due to the small size of the animals and the small field of views required for high resolution imaging. Can you talk a little bit about the benefits of using higher field systems, for example, 7T or even 9.4T for those applications? That's a great question. Uh, the uh, primary uh, difference that we have with lower field strength is obviously signal quality. Uh, at lower field strengths, you are going to uh, not be able to visualize and have as much signal quality, signal resolution as you're gonna have at higher, at higher uh, field strength systems. And uh, a, big, a big point as well when looking at these higher, uh, higher field strength systems is that you're also able to use a lot more complicated and a lot, more, a lot fancier sequences than we're often using. Uh, diffusion weighted imaging sequence, DTI, a lot of other sequences that allow you to get additional information uh, about uh, the uh, target system or the uh, features of interest. However, one thing that I would like to talk about with the uh, one Tesla scanners that we do use is like I mentioned, and I've talked about the performance, the relaxivity profile for agents is optimized at those lower field strengths. And also we uh, are able to have a pretty high throughput just based on our system and being able to have equipment in the room. And I can't stress enough how useful that is for uh, the imaging that we perform. Okay, great. And you've, you've mentioned a couple times during your presentation, but can you give the audience some sense as to what you refer to as high throughput in your lab? What's a typical day in the life of, of your, uh, your research lab? So we, uh, we wor we've worked with uh, imaging uh, these preclinical models pretty frequently, and we've gone relatively good with animal handling, anesthesia, sedation, and the techniques that we use. And also, really quickly before I go into that, I see a lot of questions about the administration method for the contrast agent, which I completely forgot to mention. I'm very sorry. We, this is primarily applied through tail vein injection. Uh, so we'll typically set up a catheter uh, through the tail vein, and we will inject uh, for these uh, for these contrast uh, applications. I didn't show any dynamic contrast enhanced data for this presentation. Um, we are uh, we are administering, uh, we, we take a pre-scan, we administer the contrast through tail vein catheterization, and then we uh, will image the animal. For DCE imaging, uh, most of these uh, scanners uh, in both Aspect and Bruker will have a port that you can have that will you can attach to the catheter and that will often be used for administering other agents, particularly agents that don't have as long of a half-life as our agent. Um, but to talk about throughput, so for non-contrast imaging, it's relatively simple and, you know, for other systems, you'll have colony imaging, looking at multiple mice in the field of view, which you can do on clinical scanners or scanners with much larger bores. Uh, for ours, we've mostly worked out a system where we're able to analyze about eight to 10 mice using that T2 weighted fast spin echo protocol uh, that I showed throughout this uh, presentation. We found that 300 micron resolution in plane is relatively sufficient for our applications though we can push that. If you go up to about a 30 or 40 minute scan protocol, you can get to about 100 micron resolution in plane. Uh, 200 micron isotropic is probably the limit at one Tesla. And again, that's another difference between um, the, um, uh, the higher, higher strength systems versus lower strength systems. Oh, uh, another good question, sorry, I just see in chat. Uh, what's the survival rate of animals that are injected with the agents? Uh, I don't have the exact data on me right now for that. I can say that we have a very, very low fatality rate with injection for this agent. Most deaths that we have are often due to handling or the health of the animals, particularly the, uh, uh, cancer, an uh, the uh, cancer models that we're looking at. Uh, if you give me a little bit of time, I might be able to look up a specific rate that we have, but we, are, uh, we have actually done uh, both toxicology 
studies for these, which are in our published literature. And we've also looked at the clearance mechanism, uh, Charmaine. If you uh, want to look at some papers from my group, particularly Eric Tanifum, uh, they've they have an amazing paper recently out um, in uh, contrast media and materials. Uh, where uh, they look at both the profile for this agent, where it accumulates, how long it takes to accumulate, and the methods for clearance. That's a very large question to answer, so I would highly recommend looking at that paper to talk about, to look more at that. But briefly, it is spleen and liver and often excretion through, um, through urine. Okay, perfect. Andrew, what, why is it so important for these blood pool agents to have long circulation? So uh, the uh, size of the nanoparticle, oh, sorry, one other question that I see here, approximately from Eric, approximately what size were the nanoparticles that are chelated to the contrast agent? Eric, I don't have that information directly on hand, but if you look at any of the publications, I believe that information is going to be in the material and methods section, but I don't remember exactly the nanometer uh, size just off the top of my head. Um, but for the uh, size, that, has, uh, that mostly has impacts on uh, kinematics and clearance mechanisms for it, and that's really really important as well for vascular imaging, Martin, the question you just asked, because for conventional agents, you'll often have windows on the order of minutes, 10 or so minutes, where you'll have the agent in the field of view, which is perfectly suitable for dynamic contrast imaging, where you're continuously injecting and taking real-time images. However, when you look at um, imaging the way that we're doing it, which we think is going to be more valuable for clinical use as well, administration and then uh, post-contrast imaging, then having this long circulation is very critical. Also, when looking at different vascular compartments, it being a true blood pool agent is very important as signal enhancement is going to be uh, either directly proportional in the case of CT or indirectly proportional uh, in the case of MRI to uh, the uh, vascular perfusion. Okay. All right. Um, what is the optimal time point for imaging post injection of the liposomal gadolinium? We often try to image within an hour. I was just talking about throughput for our non-contrast applications. For contrast applications, since we are doing tail vein injections and tail vein injections do require a certain amount of uh, uh, expertise, which we do have several people in our lab which are very good at it, thankfully. Um, we will typically image within the hour of injecting these agents, but uh, another valuable method actually is given just how long lasting and the circulatory properties of these is we'll often do a delayed post contrast scan, maybe on the order of days after we've injected the contrast when we look at tumors, because the thinking there is once it's cleared out of circulation, any tumor that any sorry, any uh, contrast that's accumulated in the periphery of the tumor is likely as a result of leak in tumor vasculature, which could be useful for better understanding angiogenesis and different leaky vessel uh, vessels. Okay. All right. uh, thank you for those really comprehensive answers. And I think you and I are both scanning through the questions um, together, Andrew, to see if there's anything that uh, stands out. Yep. So uh, Victoria Roberts has a translational question with a long T1 relaxation of the gadolinium contrast agent. How would you propose the scan protocol of an analogous human scan with a feasible scan duration? In addition, how would you propose dealing with respiratory motion in humans? So. Um, uh, I'll work backwards from that. First, the respiratory motion in humans. Um, for relatively long scan protocols, you have gating techniques which are often used, and especially if you're going to be visualizing uh, in the uh, upper abdomen area where you're going to have to worry about lung or cardiac motion, then gating is extremely important, uh, particularly for looking at relatively small vessels as motion artifact can absolutely impact your resolution for that. Um, as for the uh, first part of that question, uh, a scan protocol for analogous human scan with feasible scan duration, I would probably uh, uh, consider uh, still a scanning on the order of hours despite the relatively long half-life for this agent. Uh, again, we are still working on the translational impact for these agents. And while we do anticipate using these in the clinic, there's still a long way to go thinking about how they're going to be used, what scan protocols are going to be used. But I would probably consider about a 30 minute protocol for your average anatomical scans, your different contrast enhanced uh, subsets of scans, and potentially other types of scans like flare imaging or DWI imaging, which could be 
very useful in conjunction with contrast enhanced imaging that I haven't really talked about. Most of the sequences that I've been talking about in this presentation are relatively vanilla, but are still very robust. And I should note that you can perform TWI and approximate inversion recovery sequences using the aspect scanners and are still valid at one Tesla. Uh, Andrew, out sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm really sorry, I keep interrupting you, Martin. Uh, there is uh, another question on accreta model for adherent placenta. So that is the logical next step for this uh, placental accreta uh, study. We currently have several models that we are working on that uh, uh, that are also documented literature as demonstrating accreta models. Uh, I recommend looking in the literature there to uh, uh, learn a little bit more about those. Additionally, um, we uh, also are looking at potential surgical models as well, wire scratch models, or uh, potentially even uh, limited C-section delivery models to try and see if we can replicate uh, adherent placenta through those models. Those are all ongoing projects that we're very excited about. Uh, RPCS volume, I had that on a slide. Um, it is uh, relatively small. I can pull that up really quickly. It's gonna be on the order of about um, anywhere from eight to 20 uh, millimeters cubed cubed according to the segmentation that we performed in ITK SNAP and also confirmed with histopathology. Uh, we would expect that RPCS volume to be at least lowered in an accreta model, but I think what's going to be more likely for diagnosing accreta is going to be actually looking at infiltration across that junctional zone. So looking for disruption of that space because in those images we see a very clear like crescent pattern just opposed to between the placenta and myometrial wall that we think is going to likely be disrupted in case of accreta when we look at those models. All right. And then uh, same questioner, what is the liposomal half-life in tissue? Can you use it for steady state uh, venous imaging? Um, we can use it for say, say venous imaging. I don't have the half-life and tissue off the off the top of my head. I think it would probably depend on the uh, the uh, fractional blood volume for the tissue at hand. Like for instance, in the placenta or the tumors, it's going to have probably a half-life closer to that 18-hour mark. Uh, again, I'm going to refer to the Eric Tanfum paper, which looks at uh, liposomal half liposomal gadolinium half-life in various tissue. Um, um, uh, response, and I'm going to recommend looking at that. Andrew, Charmaine has asked uh, another very interesting question, and she's asked, uh, since the agent extravates into tumor tissue periphery, can the gadolinium agent potentially load drugs for therapeutics? That is a very interesting question. Uh, one thing that we always have to be worried about with coupling additional uh, molecules or, or like chelating additional therapies is clearance mechanisms, the size, and where it's going to actually be able to get into. One thing that we do often uh, do in, in applications with this uh, that our, our lab is published on is we've added targeting ligands to these liposomal agents for looking at biomarkers or um, other features of interest. Like for instance, in Alzheimer's or tau imaging, we have uh, worked on tau ligands that we can use for looking at those agents, which is really exciting uh, developments for that. As for treatments, uh, I I would need to talk with some of the chemical member, uh, chemical, chemically inclined members of our group for that. Uh, we would have to be worried about the overall stability of the agent for adding therapeutics, but I think theoretically it's probably possible for some of these agents. Mm -hmm. Okay. You've talked to, uh, and in the latter part of your presentation, you talked about some of the other applications, but outside of placental and tumor imaging, what other applications do you see um, uh, capable for this liposomal, liposomal gadolinium, Andrew? So we've mentioned some of the uh, tumor imaging. We're also interested in other vascular imaging, particularly cardiac imaging, looking at leak patterns or disruption of larger blood vessels, so like the descending aorta or other ones. Um, We've meant, I also mentioned uh, work that we're doing looking at Alzheimer's disease and targeting other uh, 
um, pathology or biomarkers in the brain. Uh, really, the best part about this platform is its stability, which allows us to really tinker and think about lots of different applications for these molecules. And I think that that's going to lead to a large number of different preclinical applications and hopefully eventual clinical applications for these molecules. I know that a lot of other research groups have also looked at liposomal coupled agents uh, for use as well for both imaging and uh, therapeutic means. Um, so really, I, I think that there's the, just a very, very large, large number of applications that could be considered. Mm -hmm. Aliyah has asked, do the liposomes enter cells and release the gadolinium, gadolinium inside cells, or does it stay within the tissue microenvironment for These instance, are mostly, tumors? That's a great question. This is mostly extracellular uh, uh, deposition, so uh, extracellular binding and uh, accumulation. There are some intracellular applications as well, but for the ones that I've mostly been talking about, this is mostly extracellular. Okay. Um, I'm happy to see that uh, our entire audience has stuck around for this Q&A, and it's, I'm, I'm, really, um, I'm really thrilled with all the questions that are coming in. So thank you for that. We probably have time for just a couple, of more, couple more. I do want to wrap up on time. Andrew, we've talked about this in the past. Given the safety concerns regarding gadolinium use in the clinic, uh, what is the translational potential for this, these agents uh, that you've described in your talk? So that's a really important question to think about with gadolinium applications in general. So gadolinium has increasingly come under fire and increased scrutiny just based on uh, new uh, studies about inflammation and other problems uh, that, have ha that have happened as a result of gadolinium exposure. These uh, issues have motivated us to ensure that this does not cross the placental barrier and risk uh, fetal exposure to gadolinium. However, even with those guarantees, we still always have to be mindful of gadolinium use and its issues. So we use gadolinium for these agents simply because it has such high signal enhancement. But there's no reason that we couldn't think about other contrast mechanisms like iron oxide particles or other types of molecules that have started to uh, emerge like ferromoxetol and its off-label use for uh, vascular imaging. I think that um, these, uh, these um, liposomal agents still have very strong clinical translation potential, however, because of the uh, lack of exposure to the fetus, and also because just with any sort of contrast enhanced Im imaging mechanism, you always have to weigh the trade-off between costs and benefits, aka what is the benefit to the patient, what is the potential for being able to diagnose and understand what could be happening and being able to catch something very critical versus the cost of inflammation or other side effects from gadolinium. So so when thinking about the translational impact for a contrast agent, we always have to be careful about that uh, trade-off. And um, I believe that for the agents that I've talked about today, the benefit still outweighs the cost for uh, potential issues with gadolinium, as long as the side effects and precautions are laid out out front. Perfect. One last question. In your presentation, you designated day 10 as E10.5, day 12 is E12.5. Can you just talk about that very briefly for those yes. that... That is a great wondering. question. I'm very sorry. I forgot to talk about that uh, earlier in my talk. I'm so used to talking to people that are used to thinking about <laughs> gestation. So in a preclinical model of gestation, things happen very quickly. You know, we're talking about a total time period of 21 days. So if I image in the morning, and I image in the afternoon, there is going to be appreciable difference in uh, gestational development that you can see in these models. So we'll often do a 0.5 in order to denote kind of the flexibility and kind of ambiguity in the actual time point that we're looking at. This is, however, another reason to talk about a very important question that someone asked about the time scale. We've been talking about the time scale for these experiments because of the gadolinium agent that we're using, but you also have to be really careful about your imaging and have to be relatively efficient because if I'm scanning all day, again, there's going to be actual changes. So I try to have a relatively quick scan protocol in the order of about 30 or so minutes, even for these contrast enhanced scan protocols, which is really important for uh, doing uh, preclinical uh, imaging of pregnancy. Excellent. Okay, great answer. Thank you very much. Uh, with that um, uh, answer, uh, or that question answered, uh, we have reached the 60 minute mark. So um, as I mentioned before, to be respectful of everyone's time. We're gonna wrap things up. There are a few questions we haven't gotten to, but we'll, we will be sure to do so after the fact. So um, I wanna thank you, Andrew, for your, your very interesting and informative presentation. Um, I'm sure everyone uh, 
uh, is going to walk away satisfied that they've met their learning objectives for today. Uh, you highlighted requirements for high resolution blood pool MR imaging at one Tesla. Uh, placental fractional blood volume estimates yielded from contrast enhanced T1 mapping. High resolution imaging of the junctional zone between the placenta and endometrium. And some additional applications for liposomal gadolinium, uh, including uh, neuroblastoma progression and tumor microenvironments. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure if individuals have questions, they can certainly uh, propose them through me and I can put you in touch if need be. I'll Absolutely. also make sure that after the talk, we provide some links to the references that you talked about today. So uh, with that said, thanks again to all of you for taking the time out of your day to attend our session. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at another Syntec instrumentation event in the future and have a great day. Thank you again, Andrew. And thank you all very much for uh, attending. I really appreciate all the questions. And again, you can reach out to me uh, through Martin or also uh, you can find me on LinkedIn or uh, my Google Scholar profile has uh, contact information. Thank you all very much. Great, thank you.